Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. This week, this featured story is The Last Evolution by John W. Campbell. And with me this week to discuss the story, I have my cousin Adam. I've been trying to get Adam into reading pulp stories for a couple years now, but this particular story had the hook that I needed because it features robots and Adam likes robots. That's a very simple way of putting it, but yes, I do like robots. (laughs) Very good. Adam read it, I read it, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, Just to give you a little bit of background on this, this story first appeared in the August 1932 issue of Amazing Stories. And as mentioned, it was written by John W. Campbell. I discussed him and his writings in a past episode in Who Goes There and mentioned that he wrote Who Goes There, which is the inspiration for the Thing franchise. And John W. Campbell would later go on to become editor of this magazine. So, Adam, what did you think of this story? I thought it was um, it was a good story. I just think um, the big thing about those that you can really tell that it's stuck in time because he's talking about some very complicated uh, technology here that didn't exist yet. Like he he doesn't even go into detail about um, what the machines are doing. It, he uses mainly stuff like you know blurs and words and all these different colors. But again, it was very early twentieth century. So none of this stuff existed. So he's trying to talk about something that, what we might have today, it doesn't even exist yet. So that's very challenging for a writer of any time period to come up with. But I think he did a really good job with what he had based on what he had uh, to work with. Yeah, I I definitely agree with you. Since um, this was published in 1932, and obviously nobody was launching spacecrafts or anything by then. Um, His descriptions, I thought, were pretty good as well. Maybe uh, it got a little confusing at the beginning. I wasn't sure what was a machine and what was a human. But as as he got going, he kind of clarified that. Like science investigators, I wasn't sure if science investigators were a type of machine Wait, were or, they a type? I thought they were a type of machine. That's what I was wondering. Is that a type of machine, or were the science investigators those humans? I couldn't tell either, because they did eventually end up getting destroyed, those first ones that found that first fleet. But I didn't... Yeah, I wasn't sure whether they were human. Because if they were human, uh, it would explain why they were destroyed so easily. But if they were a machine, it would have, they would have been a lot harder to destroy, because that's the entire purpose of this book, is that... Of this story, is because... Uh, machines are a lot tougher to destroy than man because they can withstand the alien arsenal, the Mm -hmm. outsider arsenal. Mm -hmm. And did you get the impression too, that when those machine, when those initial machines or robots were destroyed in space, that their consciousness kind of went back to earth? Did you get that impression? Or was that just something I, I mean, I put in there myself. I mean, I could see why, uh, I, I didn't come up with that, but I can see why you did, because they, the machines became a lot more human, because they were willing to um, sacrifice themselves for their cause. So there is an essence of humanity there. And also, I'm not sure if um, if uh, F2 had wireless or not. They could get all those consciousnesses that's, back and stuff. But, that's true. Um, yeah, I really, um, I could see how that could work, though. Mm-hmm. Although, again, I only read the story once, so I'm not 100% Same sure. There. But um, I could see that definitely happening. Mm-hmm. Just the way that how complex uh, F2 works and how all these machines are interconnected. All right. Well, we'll go, and before we get too much into that, we better summarize yes. what this story is about. And what do you see here in the year 2100? It takes place. It starts off. Um, actually, I think it starts off in the year twenty five hundred. Okay. Yeah, twenty five hundred. Yes. 
Uh, from the opening parts of the book, it says, uh, up to the year 2100, the numbers of mankind had increased rapidly and continuously, but from that time on, there was a steady decrease. By 2500, their number was a scant two millions of a population that was once totaled many hundreds of millions and was close to 10 billions in 2100. So it takes place in 2500, and then for some reason that's never explained, humanity's population dwindles down. Even from where, yeah, from the tens of billions down to just two mil- somewhere in the ballpark of two million. Which is even smaller than it is today. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, um, <laughs> what, New York City? Yeah. Just mm-hmm. very, very few people living on the earth anymore. Uh, maybe New York City's a little. You, yeah, I'm not. Sh- yeah, New York City's probably a little um, smaller than two million, but yeah. um, at least uh, <sighs> heck, if that many people are living on the world, I don't know if they're spread out or if they're condensed. That's a lot of people to spread out across. They have very few people to actually yeah. fill the planet and have them living in different areas, which makes which now makes sense as we go later in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I guess the main, um, plot that's driving this is an alien invasion. Yeah. And by this point in time, our technology allows us to send out scout ships or machines or they're not, I guess they're machines and they're not ships, but maybe I guess we should say they're machines that could go in space. Yeah. There, we're talking like it seemed like they were only inches in circumference. Is yeah, they seem. Got, I mean, they seem to be very small. But are we talking about um, those scout ships? Those scout that ships sent out yeah. there just to, for them to kind of probe and see what they were all about. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like they sent bigger, maybe bigger machines later mm-hmm. out. And basically, what happens is the aliens' technology is superior to ours. Mm-hmm. At the beginning. Well, yeah, let's get back Let's get back to the summary, actually. So, yeah. it takes place in 2500. Uh, mankind has uh, basically, they've gotten real lazy. Is it, they Basically, they just, um, they just come for themselves in normal pleasures like playing games, uh, sport hunting, stuff like that. Basically, a lot of the machines are doing the work for them now. Okay. I got, yeah. Kind of like uh, Wally. Kind of like Wally or uh, iRobot. Yeah. And, but, uh, their, uh, rude awakening comes from space, or this, uh, group of aliens known as the Outsiders come in. <clears throat> but the one weakness that we find, uh, in the Outsiders is that, um, they don't have good technology. Like, they have enough technology for when it comes to killing stuff, because when they fire out these green beams that, uh, annihilate any light, living organism, mm-hmm. any animal, a lot of plant life, uh, basically anything that can uh, breathe in any way, shape, or form is neutralized by this uh, green beam. And then we find that out with those uh, uh, investigator ships that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, they find them, and then um, mankind's like, uh-oh. This is trouble. So they start working on a new machine to help uh, fight them because they figure out that the machines are the only things capable of withstanding this green beam. So they build this robot called F1. F1 doesn't last very long, but creates this other robot called F2. And then they just keep continuing to evolve and evolve and evolve. Mm -hmm. And F1 was kind of like a... um it almost seemed like it was a collection of minds, mm-hmm. like uh, different computers rolled into one. Mm-hmm. And he created F2, and F2 was, well, while F1 was a little bit bigger, F2 was smaller. Mm-hmm. Did you get the um, feeling that F2 was kind of floating around in midair? Yeah, F1 definitely seemed to be more like a, uh, more of a mother computer. Like, mm-hmm. kind of locked on the wall, but uh, F2 was more of, like, you know... He was definitely mobile. Yeah. Okay. Like a brainiac kind yeah, of thing. that's what I was thinking. And F2, he um, is responsible... Well, I guess the the outsiders 
Do they upgrade their beam again? They either upgrade it or they just give something that allows them to repel the beams of uh, what the F2, machines. What F2, what F2 comes up with. Yeah. Okay. Because through F, because um, the outsiders end up killing everybody on the planet, every living thing on almost, the planet. Almost every, for basically two, two people. guys yeah. who F2 is able to shield under like this black construct shield that he creates or, or I think the shield kind. itself was violet oh it does it might yeah, yeah their colors come into play here because he, I'm uh, not sure yeah. I'm not sure why well, maybe he, it was just a, a way to differentiate them in the story yeah, cuz remember he's dealing with technology that doesn't exist yet he can't mm-hmm. be like oh the particle and accelerator yeah. blah 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 like he has to say that's why that's how he well, differentiates yeah. all this different technology is by the color of the beams Gotcha. Yeah, and that makes that does make sense rather than throwing in a bunch of techno babble. Yeah. And then that this beam work. shot out, then this beam shot out. It has to mm. be the green beam. The green beam mm-hmm. uh, kills everything. The purple beam protects us. And then the golden thing, the golden beam sphere thing at the end is what helps everybody. Mm-hmm. And, of course, um, one thing we should mention is the difference between Earth's machines and the Outsiders' machines or our machines can improve upon themselves and make better machines. Mm -hmm. Like they could build um, their replacements are better than what they are. So um, F1's built, he builds a better version of himself called F2. And F2 ends up building this small machine well, I don't even know if it's small. It's probably actually fairly big. And this machine that he builds, it's almost like a factory of some kind, mm-hmm. it seemed like. And it gives birth to... This giant gold thing. Yeah. We don't even know what it is. We just know it's kind of spherical in nature and it has some sort of intelligence inside of it. But we don't know what it is. And unlike the other machines, this is a machine made up of, it seems like, pure force, pure energy. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not organic, but it's not technological either. It's just energy. And basically what happens is this thing scares off the outsiders Mm -hmm. and drives them away. And evidently this is one of, if not the first appearance of the science fiction concept called the singularity, the technological singularity, which is um, evolution, evolution through technology, mm-hmm. or to some to some degree. I'm not real familiar with it. I just read a little bit about it. Um, I guess uh, an example could kind of be um, Skynet from the Terminator movies, that type of thing. But this almost seems it's like an inverse more than. Yeah, it Even seems like in that inverse Skynet, in which case it actually helps humankind instead of trying to destroy it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it also uh, evolves the machine as well. Mm-hmm. Like, let's use Terminator as an example. Terminator, the machines do get better and better because you have, you know, the T, whatever Arnold Schwarzenegger was. Right, like the, the T-800. Yeah, then yeah. the T-1000, which is mm-hmm. the dude who can uh, use his liquid metal that goes everywhere. And then there's the Lady Terminator from the third one that wasn't very good, but mm-hmm. the um, the point is is that it's sort of along those lines, but on a much more powerful level. Mm-hmm. It's to the point where the machines are evolving to where they're not even really machines; they're part part metal, part pure energy, mm-hmm. and that's actually how a new society is right. is basically built after the fall of man. Because mm-hmm. that's ultimately what this story is about. It's about uh, man's will and knowledge being inherited by the machines and having the machines carry him on. Because all man is dead. Mm-hmm. Thanks to the yeah. outsiders. Like you said, it kind of goes the evolution for life on this planet starts out organic, then it goes to the technological, and then after that it's force, energy. Mm-hmm. That's probably where it gets his name, the last evolution that title. Yeah, because it was the last evolution of man. And I guess they're not going to evolve anymore 
after this, they're just, um, that golden singularity is just gonna make more. Yeah, and didn't it? gonna populate the planet. Well, I thought F2 said like. he'd never unleash that energy again, I don't think. Oh, he did? I, I'm pretty sure at the end he said that. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, we should mention that too, that, um, the narrator, this story is told from a kind of an account of a person. And you don't know who the person is up until the end and until you find out that it's F2. Also, that reflects in the storytelling as well, because there's not a whole lot of uh, flourish in the writing style in this. It's very, this happened, then they came with this, then we built with this. It's very uh, mechanical. Mm -hmm. And then you find out at the end, it's a machine that's actually telling the story. So that works with the theme. Very, very well. Mm -hmm. It's a fitting uh, style because that's how a machine would probably write it. Exactly. Yeah. So what would you say, um, you like this one? How do you think uh, it could have been better? How do you, how would you say? It could have been better if he was able to uh, talk about the technology and separate a little bit more because you get confused with all these beams that are flying around. Mm, yeah, because I agree with that. Yeah, each piece of technology has a different colored beam, and you don't want to have like you know a color chart that you're looking at and saying like, okay, uh, green goes to the bad guys, violet goes with the good guys. And then there was a point where that machine that F two built was coming out with all kinds of these different colors, yeah. mm -hmm. so you don't know what's going on. But again, you have to look at what the author had to work with, which was very, um, especially considered by today's standards, very primitive science. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because 1932, heck, uh, the main form of entertainment was the radio, TV. and that was yeah. breaking. That was brand yeah. new. So it's pretty, it's pretty, a pretty impressive story. All things considered, especially if um, when you put into put into the context of the time period and how he came up with the idea for um, the singularity, it's um. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. It, it must have been so hard to write science fiction back then. Because all you had was, what, Jules Verne, and then that's you had that's a, basically it. Not, you had no space program. Yeah. You had no nanomachines. You had no... The biggest constructs were basically giant factories. Yeah, factories. Um, i trying to think what other science fiction writers. I'm not the biggest sci-fi pulp fan. That Edgar Rice Burroughs, his kind of interplanetary romances, but they really didn't involve spaceships. They involved, um, at least with the John Carter series that I've read, that's just him, like, astrally projecting himself to Mars. But, yeah, it's, this is, uh, really the first sci fi type, um, story I read that took place in space and it involved robots and, Aliens and yeah. basically everything you could possibly want in a sci-fi story. Yeah. Yep, it really um really covered it all and evidently um this John W. Campbell, he would after he would um go on to become the editor of this, he worked um with Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov wrote for the magazine too, I guess, and he has um you know that iRobot movie that we were talking about? Yeah. That's based on some of his writings. And Oh, is that Asimov's Theory of Robotics? Is that Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's the same same guy. He uh came up with the idea. You ever see any Star Trek movies with data? How data has a positronic brain? Yeah. That comes from Asimov's writing. So he was uh Campbell was pretty influential and I think he also um and might have influenced Asimov a little bit because this take definitely takes place. Um, it was published in the 1932. I do not believe Asimov was published at that point. I could be wrong, but I might have to, might have to do some double checking on that. But yeah, what do you think though? Would you read another pulp story that was kind of like this that had robots in it? Yeah. Asimov. Maybe an Asimov story where there's actual like robots that I think you're, I think in his stories he actually has like humanoid robots. Like androids, not yeah, just, not like just, an, not like these, androids like, or, yeah, yeah, where these ones they 
the descriptions of the machines in these were kind of vague. Yeah, but again, he had nothing to work yeah, with. Yeah, and you kind of he didn't say come out and say, "Oh, this looks like a human. This looks like a." He didn't say like F two looks like a flying, um, like a flying saucer. Or, yeah, he didn't come out and say any anything like that. It looks like a car engine. Then everybody's like, "What's a car?" <laughs> yeah, they were still brand new. Yeah, yeah, that could be. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was a pretty good story. I'll probably um try reading some more sci fi ones with robots. I'll throw them in your direction since I know you like robots too. I, I also like reading uh, futuristic stuff from like uh, a time period where they didn't know what the future was going to be like. Kind of like the back to the I call it the back to the future two uh, paradox, where it's basically we're you know back to the future part two takes place in 2015, which mm-hmm. we're only basically a year and a half away from. I'm pretty sure that 2015 is not going to look like it did in that movie. Oh, yeah. Because it's all, uh, the future's all up to artistic impression and creativity. So it's interesting to see what people in, uh, in a time period before ours thought would be like, uh, in the, but what their version of the future is. Mm-hmm. When it becomes our present. Exactly. Yeah. Like, um, the Fallout video game series did something very similar to this as well, where they took a, time period where um, basically the microchip wasn't invented, but uh, time went on and on and on. Still ended up with war with China. Still had nuclear fallout. But all the technology and all the stuff you find is all based on the 1940s, even oh. though it's hundreds of years later. So oh. I really like seeing those kind of alternate histories and all those uh, alternate futures oh, that come yeah. to fruition as well. So I would definitely yeah. read another, thing like, another story like this. Yeah, I'll have to track some of those down. I'm sure there's a lot like that in, the, in these early science fiction pulp magazines, for sure. Um, but this story, it, like we said, it's from 1932, and it seems like it's fallen into the public domain on, le- on I'm sorry, Uvula Audio. They have a very nice audio recording of this. I'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. Um, it's also for free on Kindle. There's one Kindle version you have to pay for, but both me and Adam read one that didn't cost us anything, and mm. I thought it was pretty pretty good. It's very readable. Yeah. The free one is very, very readable. It looks like it's um, just, you know, just transcribed from the old magazine. And it's also just, I think this one is just missing an illustration. Yeah, I think that's about it. And just I think that, that's it. And I think um, on a Uvula Audio, they have that illustration there. I'm not sure. I, I tried to find a scan for this magazine, but I couldn't find one just to see uh, what the drawings were like inside. And usually if you put in uh, the story's name, the issue, you'll get some kind of art just through Google, but it didn't turn, didn't really turn up anything. But yeah, we'll be sure to put those links in the show notes and um, in case you guys are interested in reading this. But yeah, if you like tech, if you like old timey, fut- old timey futuristic tech or robots or anything that has to do with this, uh, or anything like, um, what the plant will be like if man is gone or any, any kind of thing like that in the weird futuristic stuff. This is a good story to read. It's also pretty short too. It only took me maybe two or three hours to get through. And I took a lot of breaks with it. Mm-hmm. So it should be no problem getting through as well. So I highly recommend reading it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Same here. Just to challenge the people to decipher which beam belongs to. Yeah. The person. beam, the beam thing could get, gets kind of weird, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Well, thanks Adam for coming on. Appreciate it. No problem. Nice to talk to Someone else, I'm sure everyone else likes hearing another voice but mine. Sit in front of your computer going, oh, Conan was doing this. and <laughs> Leave Conan out, of, Conan out of this. All right, oh, yeah. <laughs> I hit a hot button, folks. Yep. But already, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, Pulp Crazy is located at pulpcrazy.com. I'm at Pulp Crazy on Twitter. And Facebook.com slash Pulp Crazy. And if you want to follow me and like me at either one of those pages, 
Um, I really don't do a whole lot of tweeting or posting on your feeds. I basically just put up there when a new episode comes up and I link to the YouTube video. And what else? Oh, I also put um audio files up on iTunes in case you want to take Pulp Crazy on the go. I have a link to the iTunes store on pulpcrazy.com. It's one of the tabs. You can just click on it and subscribe. I heard some people um, would like to have the files available in audio format so they could put them on their MP3 player. So I did that too. And you could email me at pulpcrazy at gmail.com. And if you want to tweet somebody, I guess you can tweet me at Icarus AG on Twitter. That's at A C A R U S A G. If you want to answer him, I will. So I'll put uh and I'll put Adam's Twitter link in the show notes too. Listen to me complain about hockey season and baseball and all kinds of other meaningless stuff. <laughs> Well, that's it for this week. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.